Anime Solastalgia Health and Well-Being. Okay. So if you go to the next one. Anime gives a word that basically describes an individual's situation uh, because of what happened in colonization and, and being subjugated um, by the system. And so um, as a result of um, this colonization and, and this imprisonment, um, we, we have there um, a person, so an animic person is a socially unstable, alienated person. Um, and then there's the other one, which, is, which also describes that person, socially unstable, alienated and disorganized. So where does this come from? How does, that, how does a person get into that state of being? And um, so if you go to the next slide, um, please, and then we talk about that. So anomie uh, is a sociological, uh, in sociology, anomie is, an, is a societal condition defined by an uprooted uh, rooting or breakdown of any moral values, standards or guidance for individuals to follow. Anomie may evolve from conflict of belief systems and causes and causes breakdown of social bonds between an individual and the community, both economic and primary socialization. E.g. E. G. alienation in a person that can progress into a dysfunction uh, that can progress into a dysfunctional inability to integrate within normative situations of their social world, like to find a job, find success in a relationship, etc. Dealing with that um, when, when you look at that, um, you begin to ask yourself, well, then how then did Aboriginal people integrate into society or attempt to become part of that society that subjugated them? Um, and, um, and of course the answer basically is that, um, I recall when they, in 1969, when they took away the mission manager from Walgut, and I guess that would be the same with most other places around Australia. Once they took the mission managers away, then all of a sudden the people who were here were not trained into being able to make their own decisions because someone else had to make their decisions for them. And, and so that now all of a sudden they have to supply themselves in food because previous to that, um, what was going on was um, the white fellas always gave out the rations. And so you had the blankets in the winter time, you had the blankets in summertime, you had the clothes in winter time and clothes in summertime. And so these were all supplied to you. Your ability to be able to move around was very restricted. And so because the people had grown up in this and um, they were born into this type of society, um, then they had very little knowledge of whether or not they, what, what their freedoms were. And, and on the other side of it, when it came to them going into town and having the ability to be able to freely go into town of their own accord, because we were always six miles or something out of town, um, the, the, the position was our people were not prepared nor trained to understand how the white man thinks, how he behaves. We, we had no idea of what he orders as priority in terms of social norms. And so we had no understanding of that, a lot of our old people. And we only knew what we had, which that people were clinging on to from our own cultural uh, knowledge and cultural background. And so the white people were not prepared for us at this time um, in 1969. And so there was, we had no measure of, of our behavior that we had to perform or any expectations that we had. So there was no briefing about that at all. No one was prepared for it. And on the other side of the coin, because the white people felt safe and the black fellows were out there under control and imprisoned on those missions, um, they felt safe. But now all of a sudden you've got all these black fellows who are able to move around and walk around within their society uncontrolled. And then all of a sudden we realized that then the police became much more involved in protecting that white society. And uh, of course, w white people still to this day, you know, like you only got to look at the reaction after Mabo. As soon as they realized that Blackfellas still had proprietary interests in land, you know, they shit themselves, literally, you know, and then they kept saying to the government, what about our land? What about our backyards? You know, these Blackfellas are going to come after that. Are they able to take all that off us? So Australia lives with an enormous guilt complex and uh, they, they, they find it very hard to deal with Aboriginal people. Every time they see an Aboriginal person on the street, you know, they panic because they don't know how to engage with us. They don't know how to talk to us. And when you talk anything about Aboriginal, Aboriginal people, 
um, then you know they they shift the blame and say you know well they they're pretty useless mob because they they don't get off their ass and they don't do anything and they're welfare ridden um, and of course um, so they you know they feel safe by saying that and it's um, putting us to one side um, if we go to our enemy two so let's let's just look at this term here uh, the term commonly understood uh, to mean oh well I don't know the funny this computer again. Um, yeah, um, is understood to mean normlessness, um, is believed to have been um, popularized by French sociologist Emile Durkheim in his influential book, Suicide, 1897. However, Durkheim first introduced the concept of anomie in, in his 1893 work, The Division of Labor in Society. Durkheim never used the term uh, norm, normlessness, rather, he described anomie as a derangement. And um, I'll just get this back again. Um, he, he talked about anomie as a derangement and an unsatural will. Durkheim used the term the malady um, of, the infinity, of the infinite, sorry, because desire without limit can never be fulfilled. It, it only becomes more intense. For Durkheim, anomie arises more generally from a mismatch between personal or group standards and wider social standards, or from the lack of um, from the lack of uh, uh, of social ethics, which produces moral deregulation and an absence of legitimate aspirations. This is an, a nurtured condition. Most sociologists associate the term with Durkheim, who used the concept of, to speak of the ways in which an individual actions are matched or integrated with a system of social norms and practice. Anomie is a mismatch, which simply, which um, mismatch, not simply the absence of norms, thus a society uh, with too much rigidity and little individual discretion could also produce a kind of anomie. And of course, when you look at that last part, that's how we were governed on missions. That's how we were controlled. And, um, and of course, then all of a sudden, people, our own mob then just lost that whole sense of, you know, um, stability within their own society because there was no norms anymore. It was all taken away from us. Our leadership was, was crippled. And I, I recall at Walgett, for example, um, how the old people used to tell us you know, that, oh, we used to dance over the back in the sand hills there. They used to walk through the fence and they'd have ceremony, a proper ceremony time. And the white fellas couldn't deal, uh, the white managers could not deal with the singing and the dancing and um, what appeared to them to be people wailing uh, in those songs. And, um, and so they stopped uh, the, and they brought police out to man the area at these times of the year so that the people couldn't get through the fences anymore and go into the sand hill and do their ceremonies. So they broke down those this very social fabric um, that maintained a very, very ordered society. And so then all of a sudden, you know, this breakdown, um, we began to lose our leadership in, the, in those communities. And of course, once you lost that leadership, um, you know, you, you have a, a dreadful situation arise where um, because there are no social norms, because there's no, no structure or, um, in place for us, young people are then left to their own imagination as to what to do. Fortunately for a lot of us, you know, we all had the capacity to sort of wander down the river with the old women and do fishing and just sitting on the river and listening to the stories um, and, you know, getting a, getting a feed because that's what supplemented our food was to be able to go down the river and catch some fish and go and us young fellas sneak out to the sand hills and you know around round um Walgut there when I lived we lived on the Namoy River in a camping zone. Um my aunties we used to go to the mission all the time and be with them. Um as young people we'd sneak onto the mission because we were not supposed to be on there. <clears throat> if they found out that we were on there, well then they, they could send the police and the welfare to come and pick us up and you know, shunt us off to some, some institution somewhere. Um, just as they did with the stolen generation, but we used to go there simply because they were our families on those missions, and um, and we maintained those connections. And of course, our families used to send us to them to make sure they had food, to make sure things were um, okay. So and and we used to hide ourselves there. 
Now, if we put up the next one, you, you begin to understand then um, some of the complications that occurred. Now, this is a word called solastalgia. It's a relatively new term um, in, in psychology. But um, it describes in the modern era, sociological and, and um, psychological studies have focused on the impact of mining. Um, and this relates to old white, old white people, mostly. Um, within, the, within the farming area of the Hunter Valley in New South Wales. From these studies, alarm bells rang because of the psychological impact that mining had in respect of changing the local physical landscape. A new so concept was finalised called Stolostalgia. And so if we go to the next slide. Right, uh, definition, right, Stolostalgia is a new concept developed to give greater meaning and clarity uh, just let me click here again, and clarity um, to environmentally induced distress. As opposed to nostalgia, the melancholia or homesickness experienced by individuals when separated from a loved home, um, from loved home, soldier stellar is distressed, uh, is the distress that is produced by environmental change impacting on people while they are directly connected to their home environment. Solastalgia is evident in the persistent drought in New rural New South Wales and the impact of large-scale open-cut uh, coal mining on individuals in the Hapaanda of New, uh, Valley of New South Wales. In both cases, people exposed to environmental change experience negative effect that is exacerbated by a sense of powerless or lack of control over the unfolding change process. Worldwide, there is an increase in ecosystem distress syndromes matched by a corresponding increase in human distress syndromes. The specific role played by global scale environmental change to sense, or to sense of place and identity will be explored in future development of the concept of stolostalgia. Now, it's, it's, this, is a, this is an interesting concept because when you look at our society, this is exactly what happened. But, you know, they, they found the need to go out there and do this study amongst old white people and look at how these, these uh, environmental changes were, were occurring um, to their situation because they lived there all their lives, they used that land, they grew up with it and, they, and their parents and, and so on since colonisation. Um, but, you see, nobody bothered to go out and do that, you know, with our mob to see how, how it impacted us. But this is very descriptive. And, and it, it describes exactly what happened to us, the impact of our old people. And, and this is what's happened, is they, they lost this sense of, um, of belonging. And, of course, watching their environment, and they were powerless to make any significant changes to that. And uh, that had enormous um, harm um, on our people, both psychologically, um, emotionally and spiritually, because their connection is no longer there. Um, and that's that has... Uh, some profound um, impacts on our younger generation because they started seeing our old people um, in this state of um, normlessness and state of hopelessness and um, and the old ones are, are frustrated because they want to do things but they couldn't and um, they were they were powerless to change their life circumstances uh, um, and because the upper hand was that you know they they had the police and the police had the guns and um, our experience from the guns was that they just kill you, and if they can't find you they poison water holes as they experienced in the north coast of New South Wales, and they just poison you and you'd f find your people laying in next to a water hole along the north coast. So they they really gave us um, a horrible time, and those experiences um, you know just transferred from one generation to another. And um, there are some science now that shows that uh, this trauma can transfer from one generation to the other. Um, and believe it or not, it's through the father. Um, that's what, what I've learned recently and that's something we can explore later if you want. Um, Taruna, can you put the next one up, please? So the New South Wales government knew what they were doing. So I put this here because this is what was said in 1943 in a parliamentary debate when they changed the Aboriginal Protection Board Act um, to the uh, New South Wales Aboriginal Welfare Board. 
And this is what a bloke called Lieutenant Colonel Bruxner said in Parliament. Um, as late as 18, 1943, the New South Wales government knew of the damage that was being done, um, done to Aboriginal people under their statutory authority protectionist regimes. Um, yeah, Lieutenant Colonel Bruxner argued in the Parliament that the greatest difficulty, of course, is that the very primitive people are tremendously susceptible to spiritual influence. When they come into contact with the white people's people, a problem that a large number of us had not understand is immediately created. Bruxner continued, the honourable... Can you do um, no, it's right. The honourable, um, um, yeah, the honour, the honourable member for Parramatta, Mr. Gollan MP, truly said that when an Aborigine is moved from his own locality, he immediately gets amongst unfriendly spirits. The spirits world, spirit world, is a tremendous force with these people. I have seen Aborigines who have been up almost half, up half the night because of bad dreams. They have been outside their own area, in an unfriendly place. One of the greatest problems confronting the department is the settlement of Aborigines where they belong. These people are frequently moved from one district to another, so as to give, their better, give them better conditions. And when we take them away from the place where they are born and reared, and where they are expected to be buried, we do them incalculable harm. Now, um, this is what they knew. They discussed this in the Parliament in New South Wales. When we look at our people being shunted from one place to another um, over the years, um, yes, of course, there was great trauma, and and, um, and then the, you know, people throw their hands up in the hair and, and basically gave up, and uh, and so the, the the will to fight was no longer there because um, there was no no um, unity. And when you got into other people's country, well, then of course you don't you don't walk around. That's not the rule in our in our society. You can't just walk around and shake hands to anybody and say, "Oh, g'day, I'm I'm Gilla. How are you? What's your name? Where are you from?" You can't do that. That's not that was totally forbidden in our culture. Um, when you're in other people's country, you sit, you shut up, mind your own business, and waiting for them to invite you in to participate and become part of their the, um, their group, and then they'll invite you to talk. Um, these days, you know, you don't, you don't give a damn who you are, who you run into. You know, our people just uh, have lost that sense of, of responsibility and sense of respect. And um, and of course, because we're we're we've been bludgeoned with this white education system to sort of a, a acknowledge and accept the way white people do it. And um, yeah, it's 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 quite embarrassing actually. And I've been in situations where I've gone with blackfellas from Canberra into communities and in different places. Um, back in the mid late seventies, and these fellas get out of the motor car and walk up and shake hands. I'd sit in the motor car and wouldn't get out of the bloody car because that's not the norm. And I, I was lucky because I'd learn in business anyway, um, through proper men business. And um, and so you get to understand that that's not the way you do things. And um, and then my old fellows who used to be sitting over there on the side watching, they'd come across and ask me who I was because they'd see me sitting in that motor car, and then they'd invite me out of the car. And uh, that's that's the proper way of doing things, um, and of course, because we we lost this sense of normlessness within our society, um, then that sort of has enormous psychological impacts on us because we don't know who we are, we don't know where we fit, and of course we we adopt um, these strangers' ways of doing things, and of course what we don't realise is that um, what was our background and how did they how did they shut us down? And that takes me to the next slide. Um, so if we go to the next slide, please. So there's this thing called criminalizing otherness. Now criminalizing otherness is about the intolerance of difference. We constantly hear from non-Aboriginal Australians that there is no room for otherness. That is language, culture or spiritual belief. Each of which unsettles non-Aboriginal Australians because they fear otherness. If they can't control it, they want it policed in, in very strong, uh, strong terms. Kerry Carrington looked, at detail, uh, looked in detail at the death of Mark Quayle in Wilcannia and concluded, 
From a sociological perspective, every white in Watkanya could be regarded in some sense culpable of creating the context in which Mark died, although some, um, some much more consciously than others. By participating in daily racial division in the town which normalised the treatment, mistreatment of Aboriginal people as a natural, um, justifiable or inevitable, the law enforcement agencies, the hospital board and the local chamber of commerce are the institutions which have to bear particular responsibility for fueling and maintaining racial inequality in the town. The historical nature of racial division in the town uh, normalises practices based on racism daily. Routine encounters expected between blacks and whites, Mark Quayle was the hapless victim of such deep entrenched disregard for Aboriginal well-being. The horrifying spectacle of racial hatred is normal in Wilcania. It happened, it happens every day. And so, and this is what's happening around the country. This is how they broke us down. And these are, so if you're looking at it from a sociological point of view and you're looking at it from an educational point of view, this is the track that one has to follow uh, because then you get a, a bit more understanding of that of that uh, helplessness and hopelessness that still, you know, pervades our community, and uh, we have a responsibility to try and make those changes. And um, how we make those changes is to understand that these things happen, and we have to get into a position where you, as students um, who are going down this road, have to understand that. Human well, you know, the well-being of human is also about human nature as well, and understanding that people who come from a very different culture, we have built within us an understanding of who we are. That's that's just who we are. That's just in our DNA. And so, within that DNA, we know that we belong to this land. Now, quite frankly, you know, I'm I'm giving a lecture on Aboriginal Day or Aboriginal Week on this thing about. Um, <clears throat> what they call always was, always will be. And I ask the question in my head, do our young people truly know what that means? Yeah, Do they really understand the significance of what we're saying? Do they truly understand what it is when we say sovereignty never ceded? Yeah, And what does that do? And I know that when I used to go home from Walgett, you know, and we'd have the, we had the Black Power Movement up, um, functioning in, Australia, uh, in Sydney, at the time, and we were very vocal, and you know we were, we were pretty brave young people. I must admit, um, all fresh out of high school when we hit Sydney in the late sixties and early seventies, and quite frankly, you know uh, those of us who took this on, um, and I must admit there was only about eight really serious people who took it on, and of course um, uh, Paul Coe was one of them, um, and Isabel, his sister, who's passed on, may she rest in peace. But we, we, um, yeah, we, we didn't care. We, we just said, you know, we have a job to do. We come from, a, a, you know, a community that's been subjugated and we have the capacity to make changes or make our voices heard. And, um, and we needed to stop this. And so these experiences that I just described to you, um, we wanted to make those changes and we wanted meaningful, we wanted meaningful changes. And as learning in those high schools how to think like a white man, we use those gifts of learning that white man's ways and then use that against him. Yeah? Too many of our people now have been caught up in the, in the gift of the white man. Um, and there's, you know, Australia is a country where um, the land um, that's been granted to people is based on a word called socage, S-O-C-A-G-E. And that's because you get gifts given to you for performing for the crown, for the sovereign. And so when you do the right thing by them, then you get all sorts of awards. And that's why I don't like these gifts of awards or, you know, things that are happening. Because, you know, if you don't do it for your people, you know, well, then you're not looking for rewards. You're looking to bring about change. And uh, you don't want to be sucked into into their realm of, um, of you know, developing these grandiose um, ideas of, of your own person. Uh, when in fact there's a bigger job out there to do, and uh, we have, we have an enormous struggle to go on, and of course, uh, 
education is great if you use it the right way. If you use it for yourself, well, then good, you know. Um, you lose, uh, and in my opinion, I'm being very hard here, you lose the right to talk for Aboriginal people if you don't go back and use your education for their benefit. I know a lot of people in our um, who, who got edu very well educated um, and now have doctorate degrees and all that sort of thing. They talk about um, what they learn in books as opposed to going back to their own mob and sitting down on the ground and saying, you know, well, OK, what's the situation, current situation, and let's have a look at that. And unfortunately, they don't look at that past history because the past history of what I just read to you and just went through with you dictates the type of life that we we lead now and people don't understand how that works and um, unfortunately when you're dealing with people who are who have been savaged by colonialism um, and being whipped and, and tortured in the way in which we have been um, I, I think we need to look very closely at how we can change those things and and quite frankly you can't do it from a you know urban setting you have to get back into country on country with people and understand the situation and and be committed to that and the changes have to be made out there where we come from the changes can't be made from sitting in an office and so we 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 have a big challenge ourselves within ourselves to really get back there and do the things that has to be done and i think i think we we have capacities i think we all have capacities and you guys are are certainly going to have wonderful capacities because you know you you're going down this road with Runa and, and learning all this stuff um, and previous to that whatever you you learnt from your parents and other people um, but you also have to understand that that, uh, that there's a thing called intergenerational trauma um, and it's very hard to get rid of unless you work on it it won't go away by itself it will stay there it's it's unfortunately part of our DNA and we have to change that whole system. We have to give people hope. So I'll leave it there Taruna and we let them have ask questions. Thanks Uncle. Thank you so much. That was that was gold. That was better than gold. Thank you so much. So, um, I have stopped recording. So, I'm happy for people to um, to switch on their videos so we can see faces. Um, thank you, everyone. And thank you, Uncle Villa. So, um, now we're just going to wait for you to ask questions. Okay, I've got one. Um, um, from an urban context, um, being an Aboriginal person that's grown up in an Aboriginal in in like white society in the urban context, um, um, how how do you approach? Um, Creating some of this change, um, uh, like as an Aboriginal person in um, in this urban context, because um, um, I guess from a personal level, having grown up here, and it's one thing, but then I, if I think about the bigger picture, um, and um, you know, with the with the majority of Aboriginal people living in you know, with the majority of you know the three percent or so of Aboriginal people living in an urban context and not sort of um having um as much connection to country as we once did um how do you think we go about um or what's some of your views about how we can create some of this um better change um and um and acknowledging like the country that we're on um to create that connection um for country and to have it sort of um enrich us Thank you. Well, quite frankly, you know, like in Sydney there, um, when you get around Sydney, um, th there are some very significant cultural sites in Sydney that very few blackfellas know about, yeah? And even white people. Um, <clears throat> and if you get people who, who can read those signs that are there, it takes you back to the cultural 
um, side of things. And, um, and then you get to understand the country that you're on. Because, like, for example, up there at uh, Kurrajong, um, you, you, have, um, you have two very important sites there. One is the site of the kangaroo and one is the site of the emu. Right? And that's our moiety in this country, yeah, the kangaroo and emu. You either belong to a kangaroo society or you belong to emu society. One is matriarchal, one is patriarchal. And so, you know, there, there are things, there are places in Sydney, and, and quite frankly, you know, I, um, uh, I think it would be a wonderful exercise to get young Aboriginal people together, and old for that matter, um, and actually develop a, a pilgrimage to these sites and, and have people explain what they mean and what they, what they truly represent. Um, because it, 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 puts, it instills pride in you, you know, and it, it, it restores dignity. Um, and, and, and value to, to something that's, that's so important to us. These things that are there um, are called ritual statutes. And these ritual statutes um, come from what we call celestial law. You know, our law, our law wasn't written down and made by some parliamentarian, black, pol black politician sitting in a circle and, and writing down a set of laws. These laws came from the creators, yeah? And and we had to we had to look after those laws. We were obligated to that because that we were part of nature. You know, we were, we were one. There was we had a well-defined system of governance that put us in in line with everything that was natural. And so when you know when the whites came in, you know they see these naked black fellows running around, carrying babies and you know looking very wretched and poor. But no, we were very lean, mean machines. Yeah. And um, and these people, and they were a happy society. Yes, we 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 lived through. Australia is one of the harshest countries in the world to live in, but we 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 understood how to how to read that country, and we live within it. And and so the colonizers who came here, you know, they were ripped apart for centuries. You know, they they kept invading each other, raiding all their communities, stealing women, raping women. They were used to all this here, you know. This was their this is their society that they came from, and so, you know, they they came from a society of those blood guts and gore, and um, and fighting over resources because they you know they couldn't control their testosterones and kept overpopulating their own areas, and so they branched out to get new resources, and so when you begin to look at this here and then you look at how we were operating in this country, we had population control, and we were we were very very you know very controlled in the way in which we did things. And, and very measured. And so in terms of um, the, Sydney, the Sydney mob there, how do you sort of maintain um, knowledge and country? I said to my mum back in the 70s that um, I had sisters and I said to her, mum, you need to teach the, you know, my sisters um, and they, um, about themselves and about their culture. And my mum responded to me and said, look, son, we're in Sydney now. Uh, we come down from Walgett. We're in Sydney, I want them to have a good education and they'll probably marry and get into jobs. And if they go and learn culture, well then they're going to have, they have oblig obligations um, once a year to go back on country and do, do business. And uh, that would take anywhere between two and three weeks, maybe four weeks sometimes, depending on the numbers of people. And so white fellas can't cater for that in a, in a job situation. So. Unfortunately, that's going to complicate things for them in their future, and maybe you know they end up with a, a jealous man or a jeal you know, and um, he don't like it going too far away, especially if they think that they're going to mix up with some you know some other man or meet some other man down the road, and then all of a sudden you have this enormous conflict within within a given any given um, situation, and we know what happens um, these days in domestic violence, um, so. You know, my mum sort of squared it off like that and said, well, that's why I'm not going to take the girls back to learn. And um, and we had the opportunity, we still have the opportunity, mind you, uh, it's not all lost, it's uh, quite intact, actually. And so we need, I, I think, um, in Sydney there to um, um, get the young people together because, you know, when, when Paul and everybody arrived from uh, Paul Coe, Gary Williams, Gary Foley, and myself and others all ended up from Maury, from Walgett, from you know Nambucca, from Cowra, all ended up in Sydney. 
we we were all like-minded we came out of those situations and quite frankly we were educated and you know we knew that we had to do something for the people back home that was our focus to do something for back home we were down there yes we had the opportunity to go and do our own thing like paul came down as a footballer i played football i didn't realize that paul was playing for canterbury and i didn't and he didn't realize that i was graded with manly Warringah in 1969 to play football you know so we were we were going past each other and then i ended up with the red all blacks and and started mucking around but the fact is that we did meet up and we met up and the thing is oh, yeah sure we had we had conflict you know personal conflicts with each other because we come from different mobs but the the great thing about it was that the black power movement started even though their personality clashes the fact is that we had a central theme and that was to go and make improvements for our mob and that's what we did we just set about and so you you set aside any personal you know conflict or or, or feelings that you may have had it was not about us the person it was about our people and that's what was important and i think you guys have a have a great opportunity now to to get back and start talking about okay what are the problems you know all you got to do mate is have a look at the last 5 years reports of the parliament in terms of closing the gap and have a look at how they fail yeah and then you work out and then you're in a position to say hang on a minute if you if you guys can't do it with these millions of dollars well then just move aside and let us bloody do it ourselves and that's that's where you get back to your own mob Thank you. You're welcome. I'm looking at all those faces. You look so sad. Smile. <laughs> Any other questions? It was Coringa, not Coringa. Oh, I'm um, sorry. I've, I've just been corrected. Um, it's Coringa Chase up up in that area there. It's not Courage On. I, I did say Courage On. Uh, it's Coringa Chase. But mind you, there are other um, carvings, uh, ritual statutes with all the stories. They're at Bondi, where the shark people are. And those shark people are connected to Tari. Them blackfellas up there, they all shark mob. And then you go down to Taramurra and around Kuji. There's also the whale carvings there. And then the big story about the whale carvings that are there, they connect to Botany Bay. And uh, you go down to La Perouse, and you've got big carvings there around, uh, around there. And um, we we do have, and I'm lucky. I've found a black fella who has been taught all that story stuff for those places and um, understand it. And then there's another big site on the other side at Kernel as well, which is the men's site. So Larpru is the woman's site, and the and the Kernel is the man place. Um, so you've got these two worlds, uh, just the same as you have at um, at uh, uh, Karingai Chase. You have the male and and female there. Um, so that, that's, that's an important um, part of that there. There is another place also where the Durrago were, and um, I was also a, um, appointed to the Land Environment Court um, back in the 90s, and um, I was about six years on the Land Environment Court as a technical assessor in conciliations. And I sat with the judge um, on, on land claims and land issues. And there was one land claim about um, they wanted to put a marina down on the Hawkesbury River and then in Durrug country. And so the court went down to actually look at the physical landscape. And then all of a sudden in the bush along the bank of the river, here's this, here's this obelisk there. And the obelisk was dedicated to the people of the Durrug because that's where the last of the Durrug people were rounded up and put at this location. And nobody knew about it. I, I was quite shocked, actually. To see it and then we found it and then of course it was pretty easy for us in the court to say no you're not going to put any marina here this belongs to aboriginal people and this is a dedicated area and we and it's not going to happen and it never happened and it's still there and very few people know of that site very few people it's a shame it truly is a shame Questions? You. So, can I ask you this question? Then there's I've got a lot of people here, obviously from different backgrounds and varying backgrounds and various ethnic groups. Um, 
when when your family came into Australia, my my question to you then is, how did your family, or have you heard of your family or grandparents, talk about how they had to deal with the racism that they met when they came to Australia in terms of um, the requirement to assimilate into this into this British society? Um, so, um, my great great grandfather was one of the first Chinese people to come to Australia, mm -hmm. and he actually had to do a lot of work to establish like a connection between um, the European and the Chinese community in Australia. So that's that was a weird little niche that my family is um, a descendant of, of in Sydney. And so, do they talk about their experiences? Um... Hand that well, down. I mean, he's long gone, and my grandma was his granddaughter, and she's passed away, so I never really got to talk to her about it. But we read because there were a few books about him, about how he established a society um, of Chinese people in Sydney, and they kind of like lobbied for like because there was like you know Asians people seen seen as lesser, so they kind of like lobbied for their own rights and to be seen as equal. So he he did have to do some assimilation because. He had to adopt like their ways of being rather than like Asian ways of being being adopted by British people. But um, yeah, it was quite interesting to read about all of that. Hmm. Do you know that we're about? I'm. Um, I've been in, inspired to develop an organisation called um, the Aboriginal Chinese Association. Yeah. Um, and the reason being um, is that there are a lot of Aboriginal people in Chinese have children. There's a lot of Aboriginal people with Chinese blood right through our nations. And so um, I did a, a, an interview with um, a newspaper, Chinese newspaper about this and they were quite shocked um, at um, the Chinese Aboriginal um, marriage and children. And so they have children back in, in their country, back in China. And um, of course they have children here in Australia and I want to develop this Chinese Aboriginal society. Um, so that we we bring those people together, and I've been I was asked to do that 20 years ago, but I thought <laughs> I thought well better late than never. Um, so yeah, that's that's an experience, and and there's something that you know I think we can all learn from as well in terms of because we understand how they mistreated Chinese. Yeah. Anyone else want to volunteer? People with Italian background should be talking about this. People with Greek background should be talking about this. I guess like a little bit different coming from <coughs> where I come from. Like my mother is Aboriginal, but my father is um, African and he grew up in um, Johannesburg and he grew up um, during apartheid. So when he came over to Sydney, he immigrated in, I think it was 1999 or 2000. So like I'm second generation. But when he came over here, like, he was very used, like, used to, like, all the racism over in, like, South Africa at the time, and having to be very clear when, you know, he was going for jobs, he's like, I am, like, I'm a black man, are you okay with me working? Because he was so used to all that discrimination over there, so I think transitioning to Australia was quite different. Like, he'd gotten, like, very comfortable with the fact, you know, like, it's quite different from apartheid over in South Africa. Like, it's a different thing, but I guess that sort of comes down to the thing of, like, I'm trying to think of how to, like, exactly phrase this, but, like, you cop it differently, mm. being a different, like, ethnicity. Like, kind of, like, there's different sides to it, and he still doesn't entirely get, like, how, like, my heritage as being an Aboriginal woman works as well. Because he's got very weird views on, you know, um, like I guess cultural traditions. Because it's kind of like, oh, it's a very uh, part of like your history. Like I don't know why you don't just count yourself as just being, you know, half African. Like, and you know, but he's warmed up to it. But I guess him coming from that context, it wasn't as like shocking for him to come to Australia, just because he already had that previous experience growing up during apartheid. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else want to volunteer? Yeah. Yeah, I know 
have it like my 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 nan um, on my mum my mum's mum. Um, she didn't really want to have a uh, a black fella as a son-in-law um, <laughs> as as my dad. Um, but um, I understood that yeah, like my mum was a strong head. Um, and so, like, she just basically said, Mum, she came home one day, one, one day and said, Mum, this is what I'm doing. I want to see who it is. And then, you know, mm-hmm. and so she goes, well, my understanding was she said something to the effect of, well, well, that's that, and had a scotch and just got on with it. Good on her. Um, you know, and, and, um, and, um, I think too, like there's when I when I want to speak um, in defence of um, um, my mum's side of the family too, um, you know, because we're all people, um, and no one's perfect, and and I also sort of would like to sort of float the idea that there is a lot of intergenerational trauma. And unresolved um, business for white Australia in dealing with all of this stuff that has happened. Um, now, like a lot of um, like because like we know we know through um, we know that like um, as you pointed out earlier that there is um, and has been scientifically proven that. Um, um, PTSD is um, transmitted, tran- transmitted from one generation to the next through DNA. Yeah. Um, and that doesn't happen just for Aboriginal people. That happens for everyone. And so, um, and like I think there were there was a lot of. I mean, there are a lot of really good people in Australia um, um, who are not Aboriginal um, who you know like who I think I think something like dad explained Brewarana to um, my wife and me a couple of years ago when we went up there for this big um, celebration he said there's the blacks there's three kinds of people in Brewarana there's the blacks who don't speak to any, anyone else but the blacks the whites who don't speak to anyone else but, but the whites and then you've got everyone else in the middle and he goes I've always been in the middle and I've always played it right down the middle. Um, and um, when you have that, um, you know, for, for, for non-Indigenous people who have had this kind of trauma and associated trauma and seeing this stuff that has happened um, to Aboriginal people, um, you know, since um, invasion, um, there's a lot of, ill feeling and um, hurt and they don't know actually how to a lot, of, a lot of people don't want to actually acknowledge or admit to like the stress and the, and the anguish um, that they go through when they see this, some of this stuff but because you know like I might you know like but some people might not want to say anything because they don't want to rock the boat um, or they don't want to um, Bring attention to themselves, um, any sort of negative attention to themselves, because um, because they just don't want to have the they don't want to have the attention on them, and you know, um, and because you know, like if, if there's a black fella copying it, um, it's just like well, everyone else just shuts up, you know, like when the teachers when the teacher in school, like in primary school, was yelling at one one person, everyone else just shuts down. And then, and then because it's like okay, because that whoever, you know, little little Johnny who was doing the wrong thing, he 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 he's copying it now, and everyone just waits until he cops it, and then then we can all move on. You don't want to sort of get into it, you know, um, because then like then you might bring attention to yourself. So and it's the same with like adults, you know, like it's almost like when you see something bad happening, you don't want to bring attention to yourself. So. But then, like, if you if you did see something that was horrible, and um, especially speaking to you know the atrocities that um, have happened over the years, um, 
how like how do people actually speak about that <clears> amongst <throat> their own circles, or do they speak about it? Is mm. that you know like what are the mechanisms, mm. and you know like and how that sort of then becomes PTSD? Uh, I don't know. Well, you know what what you yeah. yeah now what what you're saying there is is very apt because one of the things is that people get lost in that trauma. People get lost in in not knowing how they should react or how they should be doing it. And everybody thinks there should there's a script somewhere, you know. And are they following that script um, in you know in, to normalize their life? No, it's not. There there is no script. Um, and your your life is complicated by the virtue of you know, your societal um, um, surroundings. And, of course, the, the most difficult, of course, is to try and weave your way through that maze, you know. And, 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 and unless you have confidence of who you are, like I have a son right now who's doing a PhD on identity with the Aboriginal male, and um, he's doing it at ANU. He's doing a doctorate thesis. And one of the things that, um, you know, that... that really trying to, uh, he's trying to understand, is understand what Aboriginal males think of themselves, you know? Where do they place themselves and how do they identify? And, and what is it that makes them identify um, um, the way they do? And are there other, influ what are the influencing factors around that? Is it, you know, are they focusing on their own background, their own cultural norms? what they know or what they don't know or are there these uh, instinctive urges that they have inside that are that are just inherent through their dna uh, that makes them you know who they are and um, because you see uh, like i was saying earlier you know they destroyed the normal society there's no there's no normality within our society and so when you begin to look at okay what is it uh, what is it uh, what does it mean to be an Aboriginal person? Well, then, where do you? Where, who's the? Who's the? Who's the model? Where's the model um, that you use? What? What is it that you look to um, to ascribe to and say? Well, that's what an Aboriginal is. Do you look at Arnhem Land or do you look at, you know, Alice Springs and Uluru? Um, you know, and if you look at those things and say, well, they're the they're the real Aborigines, well, then you know you've automatically marginalised yourself um, from your own society, you know, because you're looking at others to try and sort of, um, you know, I suppose to push off on um, from to say, well, that's who an Aboriginal person is. And unfortunately, you know, we, we're caught in this bind because, you know, even today people say, you don't look Aboriginal, you look more like an Afghan or you look more like a Arab or something like that there, you know, or a Greek or an Italian. And of course, you know, um, how does that make an Aboriginal person feel when you're confronted with that situation? You know, oh, you don't look like an Aborigine, you know. Um, and, and so how does that make one feel? And you, you begin to sort of question yourself and, you know, you sort of go home a little bit and you sort of, um, you know, you've, you've lost a, maybe a half inch or a centimetre from your height because, you know, you, you're starting to shrink in your, in your level of confidence. Um, and, and, of course, this is a real issue. And um, and it does have um, you know that that does play on people's spiritual and emotional well being you know and um, whereas you know I love I love Paul's attitude you know Brittany's father's attitude because he, he used to embarrass me all the time sometimes because he'd get up there and he'd be would be in a in a you know question and answer situation and they'd ask some ridiculous question and I know that there's an easy way of doing it you know getting around some of these stupid questions but Paul would just tell him to get fucked you know pretty easy um and you know and i love that attitude I, I loved it but i was you know sort of always um yeah I, I grew up um in a thing where sort of trying to go down an easy road but you know i, I like paul's shortcut and um and you know the same with his sister the same thing and and you know there was another fellow called billy craigie who who had the same attitude you know he's a gumroy man and and you know i'm i'm the like like, I'd shoot any bastard, me, if I had a gun. You know, I'd go to war pretty quickly if we had the numbers. Don't get me wrong. But, you know, there's another way through this. <laughs> and um, and I've always sort of tried to look for that other road. And sometimes, you know, uh, Gary Foley and Gary Williams and all them just wanted to knock me over and bloody jump all over top of me because I was trying to take a, a smooth road. But there was no smooth road. There's no smooth road here. Um, and, um, 
you know, the road is full of corrugation and full of pit holes. And um, unfortunately, yeah, we, we raised the bar. We raised the bar to breaking those, the, the control um, that they had over us. But unfortunately, now we have the moderate Aborigines, the control, who have got control of Aboriginal affairs, who have taken us back into, a, into that noose and neck change of the white uh, colonial society. And unfortunately, you know, we're now bowing to their um, plans as opposed to us planning things for ourselves. And we're not militant enough. We, we've lost that aggression. And, um, yeah, militancy is important um, if you believe in something. You know, you, Aboriginal affairs would never have changed had we not got to the streets and made a loud noise. We didn't care, you know. OK, you get locked up, you get kicked around and by the coppers. And, you know, this is, what, this is how change happens. Yeah, um, and unfortunately, they don't like confrontation, and they don't like being told. And so, you know, we're still in that in that gloom um, of darkness that um, we need to change. We need to change it, and um, it's a rough road. It's not easy, but we have to change it. So, Taruna, do you think we should send them? Um uh, to the breakout room for five minutes, so I think people that's... can discuss um, these race-related issues and come back and give you feedback. I think that's a I think that's a great idea. So you guys have you all have five minutes until you don't have to go into a breakout room, and neither do you, Auntie Ellie. But the rest of you, you go in, and we need a volunteer from that group to come up and and give provide Uncle Villa with feedback. So thank you everyone, I'm opening up the rooms.